All right, Waniska, bom dia. Good morning to you, Adina, and to everyone who will be joining today or later on to see this video. Hawa, hi, hi. Thank you for agreeing to chat this morning on a Friday morning and let us know what's going on at home. Um, so can you please introduce yourself? Gwoljat anga kiltlai anga hadalasis delang auf kiltlagam. Do you au hadagam? Da odas gustu di kalagam. Do you ja afanas gagam? Kunja das hinu di had kilkian. Jackin jas hinu di non had kilkiagam. Kun au hinu di au kian. Um, good morning, good people, uh, people held in high esteem. We, I am a Haida from Masset. I am the Jothlanis clan. I belong to the Eagle Moiety. My grandmother Haida, Haida name is Jetkinjas. My mother's Haida name is Kunao. Um, and I'm I'm here in Old Masset, and I'm here to talk about the occupation of our traditional lands uh, right now, where a fishing lodge, Queen Charlotte Fishing Lodge, um, decided to open um, despite the nation's decision to remain closed. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Queen Charlotte Fishing Lodge. Were there two that have decided to open? Well, there's Queen Charlotte Fishing Lodge. Yes, they are um, within, um, you know, they're within 10 kilometers of where our people are occupying the land. And West Coast Fishing Club um, is further away. I don't know the exact distance. Um, and then I believe a third fishing lodge may have opened. Hmm. For those who aren't from Haida Gwaii, aren't from the coast, what are these sport fishing lodges? What is sport fishing? Who comes to participate in that kind of activity? Um, sport fishing is a, it's a vacation for um, clientele who go out on speedboats they have a license uh, and they have a limit on how much fish they can catch and once they catch their limit um, you know if they catch it within a reasonable amount of time because they paid the money to get to those resorts they um, stay on the water and they continue to fish. They, they play with the fish and um, those lead to high mortality rates. So our salmon stocks deplete from the amount of guests that come out and um, the amount of fishing and sport fishing that they do. So the sport of it is, you know, to, to catch your limit. And uh, if you catch it too fast, then you pay all that money to do what? To sit in the lodge. They, they come out to be on the water and they they choose to stay out there and they choose to um, continue to fish and, and uh, catch and release and uh, just for fun devastating to our stocks just for fun hmm. and you told me your husband is a commercial fisherman so and how does that kind of relationship to fishing differ from the way that you understand fishing and harvesting? Commercial fishing, um, you know, there's a market for it. They, they keep what they catch. They sell it to the markets. They sell it, you know, it goes all around the world and uh, there's no, there's no catching it for fun. There's no right. playing with it for fun. There it's, um, and traditionally, uh, you know, that's what we've done since time immemorial. That's our food sustenance. That's our protein. That's our. Um, that's what identifies us as as people. And um, 
when we have people who go out and play with the food, that's another one of the Haida laws that we've been taught is we don't play with our food. One of our stories is of uh, the octopus village under the sea and uh, two boys were playing with an octopus that they found under the rock and they were corrected to not play with them and put them in harm's way. And the octopus went back to the village and, and told the octopus village what was going on and the octopus village um, declared war. They, they got ready for war and um, you know, those are our supernatural stories that identify us and and the human village got word that the octopus village were were preparing for war. So instead of going to war, they made it right. They went back and they corrected things and and saved themselves. So tell us what has been happening. What was the decision that was made on July 9th? when communities got news that these sports fishing lodges are opening up and that there would be potential outsiders coming in um, and potentially bringing COVID. We're in the middle still of a global health pandemic, right? I'm here in Brazil right now speaking to you um, where cases are continuing to multiply. I'm in a small town and cases went from one to 50 in over a night. And, you know, also I'm in an area where there's not the medical services available to um, withstand a, a large number of cases and severe cases. So give us a little bit information on what the situation is like on Haida Gwaii. If there were to be a case that arrived, what's at risk here? The risk is devastation, much like the smallpox epidemic. Um, the smallpox epidemic was... Uh, <clears throat> a sickness that was purposely introduced to Haida villages to wipe the Haida people out. They, did, they didn't want Haida people to exist. And the devastation of COVID-19 coming to Haida Gwaii and putting our community members at risk, as well as our elders, our fluent language speakers, our, um, our children, uh, it's a trigger for many people that what would the survival rate be? And COVID-19, you know, they, they say has the 1% mortality rate, but the, the after effects and the recovery um, are substantial because once, you know, some of the studies that have been shown now, you know, you're not 100% you're not uh there there's other health factors that are in play and um <clears throat> it, it would be we wouldn't have the resources the healthcare services to be able to control an outbreak we have all of the population on Haida Gwaii not just in Old Masset but the population of entire Haida Gwaii we have two ventilators Mm -hmm. We have hospitals. Uh, each hospital we can bed up to 12 patients. Mm -hmm. And those 12 beds are not always empty because we do have other people who have, have um, um, you know, health needs that they need that need to be met and occupy those beds. So all of a sudden we go from 24 beds down to 12 beds or six beds. And if an outbreak happens, we have nowhere to put those people. Um, and and the two ventilators, you know, we've had people say, well, why can't we just get more ventilators? We can, uh, but then we don't have the human resources to be able to operate and, and use the ventilators as they should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was the decision that was made by Daughters of the River and who exactly are Daughters of the River? So there was no decision. Uh, it wasn't a, like a formal meeting. It wasn't any. It wasn't anything political or anything uh, that a meeting need to um, uh, official decision making. I guess wasn't had, but it was um, 
empowerment to our people to let them know that this is our inherent right to occupy our land. And I Gujalang are uh, grassroots people who are taking that initiative and embracing the empowerment that is being given to occupy the land to harvest our traditional foods to help us maintain with uh, maintain food security within our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had people um, get cut back on their income due to the pandemic and we fall back on on our traditional harvesting. We have uh, the, also the impact of the pandemic and the impact of, of um, travel and being safe and keeping Haida Gwaii safe. I've seen um, and heard and know people who want to come home to Haida Gwaii who normally would come home to Haida Gwaii to harvest and help them with their food security in their, in their urban communities where they decided to live. and with the respect and, and the understanding of how the impact of COVID-19 coming to Haida Gwaii, our, our own people are respecting our wishes and not coming home. They're, they're, not, they're sacrificing their family time, they're sacrificing their winter harvest, they're sacrificing so many different things. They're sacrificing maybe they have family members who are sick here on Haida Gwaii that they can't even come and visit them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had we've had uh, funerals in our communities that we have to learn to adapt to, and we we have people who can't even come home and and send their wishes and pay respect to the loved ones that they've lost, and it's devastating to think that the lodges feel like it's okay that it's you know. We have to survive. The economy has to survive, and it's devastating to think that it's okay. They think it's okay for them to open up and to operate with business as usual when we have, you know, family members and community members who can't be here to support like they would or get that food that they need for the winter. Mm -hmm. How have these lodges justified their decision to open to outsiders? Um, and I read in the press statement, it's mostly American clientele. Is that right? It's mostly Americans who would be coming, spending the money, a lot of money, right, to travel and have their private transportation to get to these lodges. Um, is that right that it's American clientele? Their clientele is known to be American. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, they're their statements are that they um, are only open to Canadian clientele, um, but previous years, previous um, operations know, know that it's uh, American clientele that are coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have said, these lodges have made a point to say, we're going to take new measures, safety precautions, but they have not been open to the possibility of remaining closed for the time being? Right, so the statements that I have seen were from one of the West Coast Fishing Club, that one's on Langara Island, um, was that they went through extensive, extensive measures to make sure that they're following um, health authorities, um, WorkSafe BC and provincial laws that are put in place, um, but there's no mention of respecting Haida law. Mm -hmm. There's no, um, and, and that's not to say that they're not uh, trying to reach us or be in contact to see what it will take to open. You know, it's not to say that they're, they're not making that attempt, but the Haida Nation have stated that during this pandemic we we're going to remain closed until we feel like it's safe to do so and the Haida Nation and communities have not determined what safe looks like to us right now and we're going um you know we're watching the world we're watching BC we're watching how things are rolling out and as things roll out things aren't getting any better and until we feel like it's safe to 
open up, we're not going to open up. And we're just asking that these lodges respect Haida law as well as the other laws that they're, you know, that, that they're respecting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pre-COVID-19, what is the relationship like with these lodges in terms of that respect and acknowledgement for Haida law? Has that existed previous to this health pandemic or is this an ongoing situation that's just, you know, been heightened by the gravity of the situation right now? I think it's been heightened by the gravity of the situation. We have some of our, our locals who go out all the time every year and uh, it's um, heightened this time because we have more people who are upholding that right to be able to harvest and, and we're occupying in the same area as the corporations are operating and it's uh it's it's caused some it's caused a lot of heat they're they're um it's 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 always been a tough relationship and uh you know west coast fishing club in in the statement that they released on friday mentioned in there how much you know, the millions of dollars that they put into operations and employees and the millions of dollars that they um, put out there to the economy for groceries and operating. And, and, you know, really, they emphasized at the end of their statement how much they contribute to the economy. But what they don't realize is that what we're talking about, we're not talking about our economy. We're talking about human safety and well-being. We're talking about... Uh, we're not negotiating a profit margin. We're negotiating our identity, our, our who we are as a people. We're negotiating safety and well-being of human beings, not the economy. Thank you for that. Um, are there other lodges that are operating in Haida territories that have decided to remain closed that are respecting Haida law? We do. <clears throat> we do have uh, lodges right in, in community in Ma in New Masset and they've they kept their doors closed. They are choosing not to operate. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So it is possible. It is definitely possible. We had um you know our gas stations here uh on Haida Gwaii they put signs up to say that we have the right to refuse your service. We're essential workers and won't be put at risk. Yeah. We have other businesses who who are taking a hit on not opening up. We have people who run uh, small tours within within the community. We have uh, small boat operators who are able to take day trips with um, visitors who are coming to to see our lands and to see to see what. Haida Gwaii is all about and mm -hmm. they're respectfully choosing not to open up because they they believe in the safety of our communities and they they can see the impacts that COVID-19 will have if, um, if it comes to Haida Gwaii mm -hmm. and um, I, I wish that people would would support us and respect the laws that we have that we put in place and you know not to go down a political road and make political statements but you know with the knowledge of um the province of bc being the first province in canada to implement legislation around undrip that's recognition of indigenous people and what they stand for so the recognition is is it's there it's in legislation indigenous people have rights we all we always have and uh we, we need to be respected. That's right. And it's the province that's given the lodges the green light because the province also has the power as well to say, you have to remain closed, but the province has given the green light to these lodges that think that that's the only law that they need to be abiding by. Is that right? Within the phases of the province opening up, yes, um, I don't know how the province feels about um, who has the law and who has the authority. 
um, but just recognizing that those that that we do have um, our rights and we we are accountable to each other to uphold uphold our our inherent laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as contribution to from the lodges um, to communities, it's not directly into communities. The, the, they say, you know, they say they contribute a million dollars into operations, but those operations, um, you know, they don't have 100% um, Haida communities employees out there. They have people, and I can speak from my experience. I, I actually worked out at um, West Coast Fishing Club about mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I was out there as a chambermaid. I didn't get to host guests. That's what we do as Haida people. We host people. I didn't get to host them. I was hired as somebody to clean up after, after the people. Mm. Mm. I also, you know, seen that when the helicopters come in, um, the employees, you know, the way they do a changeover, we fly people out. We um, on helicopters. They get loaded onto the helicopters. They have at West Coast Fishing Club. They have a helipad right near the um, right near their accommodations, and uh, we call them, you know, heli boys. Um, and those are the staff. They would run back and forth, getting the luggage off the helicopters and dropping them in a place where the um, housekeepers and, and other um, uh, staff can bring their luggage in and put it, bring it to their rooms and stuff. And I know one of our Haida boys, he, and this is what they're taught in their orientation that when the guests are coming off the helicopters, it's their responsibility to go out to the helicopters, offer their hand, to help them step down off the helicopter. And I know one of our, our heli boys, he's, um, he, he gets dark skin in the, in the summertime. He gets really nice and brown. And uh, he went to go reach his hand out to help one of the um, visitors off the helicopter. And she put her hand out to go accept the help. And then she looked up and she seen the color of his skin and she pulled her hand away. Like these are the people that are coming to our territories who can't even respect an open hand to help even take a step down off the helicopter. Um, these are the type of guests that they have coming to our lands, our territories, mm -hmm. where we've been since mm -hmm. time immemorial. And we ask for respect and to keep Haida Gwaii closed. We don't need, we don't need to, um, Put our safety at risk. Mm -hmm. We have a small percentage of employees who are out at the lodges. Mm -hmm. They advertise that they empl employ locally, but it's such a small percentage. Mm -hmm. I also know that uh, the guides that come and operate the boats, they're, some of them aren't even from BC. They get flown in from across Canada in some cases. Mm -hmm. Well, and when companies in a young, very colonial country like Canada, when companies make statements like, we provide these services, we provide this revenue, and then they never recognize that it's all on stolen lands, like they're providing these services for an area that Haida people have stewarded and cared for that are within Haida territories, and it seems that that doesn't get mentioned. Is that right? That's right. So there's, that's the other side of the coin that seems to be. Yeah, there's no acknowledgement of the territories that they're on. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. there's no history. There's no history or explanation to the guests on <clears throat> how they were established or <clears throat> who, you know, there's none of that brought up. Mm -hmm. What 
how has uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, how has it affected you and your life and your community in the past months since the it kind of started breaking out in March? It's me about and five life, months now. Yeah, yeah me and my life, um, personally, uh, I feel like, I feel like, um, It's been really hard um, because we can't go visit freely and, and do any of our ceremonies or practices that we normally would have as, as a Haida person. Um, we have um, <clears throat> dance groups who come who would come together once or twice a week and practice our songs and dances and with the regulations in place of social distancing and keeping place and not having large gatherings. We haven't been able to do that. <clears throat> um, I've had a couple of deaths of people who are really close to me and we haven't been able to have a proper funeral. We haven't been able to console each other and be, um, support to each other like we normally would. We can't gather in big places. We can't um, hold our, our traditional ways of, of putting our loved ones to rest. Um, I have four children who can't freely go and visit their friends and family like they would. Um, we've, we've been pretty... Uh, at home quite often and, and the kids are really understanding of the safety of us and uh, we've had, we have, um, you know, our language, is, we don't have very many language speakers and we have a lot of people who are dedicating their time and efforts to uh, revitalizing our language and keeping our language going. And with one of our programs that we had called the Haida Gwaii Mentor Apprentice Program, that's been you know, it, it put a, a bump in the road for us where we have apprentices, people who sign up to to do this program and they complete a certain amount of hours with, with a, a fluent speaker. And we haven't been able to um, move full force with that because of the safety of putting our, our language keeper at risk because our language holders, our fluent speakers are, are mostly older, older generations in their 70s, 80s and 90s. And we can't risk um, their lives. We can't risk their health. Mm. <clears throat> There've been a lot of sacrifices in this time. I can't imagine what it would feel like as a Haida person to get the news that these lodges are not only considering opening, but opening and putting so much at risk. Thank you for taking the time to share. Is there anything else that you would like to share at this time, letting people know um, any kinds of awareness or plans of action or support that we should know about? So I'm just looking at some of the comments that are coming up here. Um, <clears throat> I'll just have a look. Let's see. Yep. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, anyone who's listening along, please feel free to ask questions in the comment section for Adina here. So you have Nicole Bird, no respect or acknowledgement of the Haida Nation, even in their advertisements. The focus mm -hmm. always will be about the money and the expense of the Haida Nation. Respect Haida law. Um, we have so many teachings of how we harvest, what we can harvest, when we can harvest, where we can harvest, mm -hmm. and you know we uh, where Queen Charlotte Lodge is is operating right now. We have a cemetery, and these guests think it's. Uh, I don't know what they think. I don't know what is in their right mind to be able to. Mm -hmm go to our graveyards and take pictures of them. 
our ancestors who've passed in these villages that were, you know, death caused by a smallpox epidemic to wipe us all out. Like, where's the joy in taking pictures of that? Where's the respect in taking pictures of that? Where's the comfort in them knowing that they're on a holiday, putting our lives at risk and potentially putting us all in the ground, just like those, those, those cemeteries that they're visiting. It's, it's definitely, it's mind boggling to, to, for me to understand what did it, what is it? What, what is, what is the joy of coming to our territories and not acknowledging whose land you're on and not acknowledging the impacts that are being had by our local communities, by our people who are out there getting the fish that we need, the food that we need, practicing our traditions that we've always had, and feeling these lodges, the, the guests at the lodges are feeling like we're imposing on them. I had a community member talk to us and she was devastated. She was angry. She was mad. Her husband, my uncle, he's my uncle. He's been, <clears throat> he's been fishing. He's, he's a boat builder. He builds boats and he, he gives these opportunities for people to be able to go out on the water. And he was out on his boat and he goes out by himself. We, we know what we do. We know our waters. We know when we can go, when it's safe. And people, people keep track. We have our own safety things in place that we've been doing before the establishment of these lodges. And he was out there on his own and he came back and he told my auntie, he said, two lodge boats came speeding at me on either side. We're not being respected on any level. And it's, uh, it's, it's, devastating it's disrespectful it's it's privileged very very privileged and this is our right to be out there it's completely unacceptable um can you tell me about the occupation you know, you made it very clear. This is not a reoccupation. I don't even know if you use the word occupation. I've seen it used in some press uh, around the situation, but people are living their lives, upholding their inherent rights and laws. Can you tell me about what that what that's looking like at home on the ground? Yeah, we we have. Um, People who, who are at camp right now, um, there's a cabin out there um, where they've they've set up a kitchen. They they have and there's food out there for them to cook. They're cooking food that they're catching. Um, they've been they've been really uh, fortunate to be empowered to be out there because they get to eat the fish that they catch every day. They get to eat the Dungeness crabs that they are catching. They have they get to eat the prawns that they're catching. They get to harvest the berries that are out there. They get to um, they get to preserve um, some of the catch that they don't eat. So they they're out there they're able they are having the abilities to jar our foods to store away for winter um, until the next season comes up again. They have, it's, it's creating an opportunity for these people, for um, our, our people to bring food in for the elders, for the families who haven't been able to get out on the waters. Um, it's, it's a, uh, community communities coming together to make sure we're taking care of each other to make sure we have something to eat to make sure we're being to make sure we're safe out there um and safety along with safety you know the the rcmp went out there um not the local rcmp but the rcmp from maybe prince rupert i'm not in, exactly sure where they came from but 
they went out there and uh, one of the videos that we released on, on our Facebook page, on Le Gujalang Facebook page and Instagram, um, was one of our ladies who were out there said they went out to go set the net and they went ashore for about 10 minutes and they went back to go check the net and the net was gone. So they contacted the RCMP and um, somehow they knew where exactly the net was. Hmm. And they had asked the RCMP, you know, why, why are you out here? And the RCMP's response was it's for the safety of everyone. And the response to that was, if it's for the safety of everyone, why have you gone to every single lodge boat and not come to check on us at camp? Mm -hmm. You haven't once come to any of our smaller boats who are occupied with all women to come and ask if we're okay. And today, today we have our local RCMP are going out to, to check on camp and make sure things are okay and see how our people are doing out there. Cause we have, um, you know, there's men and women out there. It's not just all, not just all women. Um, we have children who are out there, can be out there for the weekend. And, you know, we're just practicing upholding our, our right to occupy the land. Mm -hmm. And we, we just feel like, um, you know, not only the risk of COVID-19 that they could bring, it's uh, it's the boat safety. Right. There's no, you know, the story I shared of my uncle being um, harassed, I guess is the word, the way he was. He's, um, he's not out there. Um, to hurt anybody. He's not out there to interrupt anything. He's out there to catch his food. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's in his 60s. And the privileged people don't understand that uh, we're, we're not inconveniencing them in any in in any way, shape, or form. It's a privilege that they have that they they don't even recognize as a privilege in my mind. Mm -hmm. And that's my uncle's life. They put at risk. He's not out there ready to record what the lodges are doing. He's not out there ready to to come back in and report. Oh, the the lodges are doing this. He's out there getting the food. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking. Um, I'm looking at the comment here. Killed the Guaya Hada, mm -hmm. who in their right mind would throw a bunch of people that don't even know each other together from all over Canada and send them to our homelands to play with our food, especially during the serious global pandemic. That's so wrong on so many levels. Our children even know better than that. They've been taught in very short term, uh, in a very short time, that it's not safe. And that's absolutely right. Our children understand the safety and, and are being taught how to be respectful. And since school ended, since the school closed, you know, my our little guys, I have I have two boys. Um, who are six and nine years old and they want to see their buddies. They want to hang out with their buddies every day and they can't because of the virus. And they know that we can't be traveling around that we don't know where the virus is. And they've been really respectful of that. They've been really understanding and really resilient to being at home stuck with mom and dad all day, every day and um, really patient. Um, I guess it's, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I see uh, Brandon, Brandon's comment, uh, we've sacrificed regular employment due to COVID. Um, we're working hard to keep it safe here. Uh, Brandon, Brandon's my husband, who is a commercial fisherman. He's, he stayed home this fishing season 
with the close of the economy and and um, you know not risking that going out to other communities and delivering in different communities and crossing paths with where COVID maybe can be and uh, that's it's it's been it's definitely been a struggle to be able to be at home for Brandon as a commercial fisherman. He's been on the water since he was six years old, same age as my boy. Our, our kids, he takes our kids out on the boat with him uh, when he goes fishing. And he hasn't really been able to do that a lot this year. We have the grandparents who live down on Vancouver Island. We haven't been able to go down there. Um, you know, as, as a commercial fisherman, he hasn't been able to go out and accumulate um, the amount of dollars that he needs to be able to collect uh, EI benefits, you know, for off season. There's the market's been so small. We went when the pandemic um, happened, our commercial fishermen, they would go and catch halibut and they would sell them to the, um, what do you call them, the processing plants. Mm -hmm. And they would sell the halibut for, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't say, like it's in the double digits amount of, maybe Brandon, if you're listening, if you can comment how much a commercial f fisherman would normally send, uh, sell you know, halibut to, to the processing plants. And when COVID started, you know, they, people were still going out to catch the halibut, but the processing plants were selling them for, you know, or buying them for a dollar seventy to a pound. They went from buying them, from buying that halibut to uh, buying that halibut from maybe like $17 a pound, $24 a pound, $29 a pound. You know, the, the price changes depending on the market, I'm guessing. And, um, you know, they went from that, selling halibut at that price a pound to $1.17 a pound. And the way commercial fishermen collect their EI is by how much they make in a fishing season. So uh, selling it, a dollar seventeen, um, selling it to a processing plant at a dollar seventeen a pound, is nowhere near the amount of money to be made that qualifies them to get on EI. Mm -hmm. And then that would carry that would carry them through a season, um, you know, the winter season, and then fishing starts up again. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that's that's a struggle that we're looking at right now, and how. How do we, what does it look like for, for fishing to open up again for commercial fishermen and, and the, um, the sales in the world? How is that going to be impacted on us, you know? Right. It's a big change, but you know, he, he chose to be, to be at home because we're not going to sacrifice lives for money because on Haida Gwaii we have those resources to sustain us mm. we have resources to we have you know we have the fish in the sea to feed us through the winters we have the fish in the sea to replace chicken and beef from the store we have um we have our berries to harvest during these summer seasons to keep in our pantry to keep in the freezer we have our, our traditional plants that we use for medicines. We have we have our um, medicines. We have so many things here on Haida Gwaii that, that have been ours and always will be ours. And the, pr the privilege of, of these people who are coming thinking it's okay, we're not putting anybody at risk. They actually are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a twisted, bad nightmare, reoccurring nightmare, because like you've mentioned, this is not the first time. Um, here in Brazil, Indigenous communities have been really affected by COVID-19, and mm -hmm. a lot of communities have been infected by outsiders as well, mm -hmm. by 
um, government workers who have brought the virus into very remote communities and the gravity of the situation. There's been over 450 deaths of Indigenous community members, elders, leaders, and the situation here in the so-called Global South um, has really also highlighted this ongoing colonial violence, the colonial violence of a mindset that people have the right to go into others' territories, you know, also the ongoing inequities and social economic disparities that have been forced onto communities that have survived attempted genocide and colonization. So it's no small thing that we're talking about. And I know it's not easy to put words around. So I, I really do. I thank you for your time and the courage it takes to have this conversation, you know, in this way, you know, online, um, mm -hmm. in the kind of new things that we're getting used to. Um, is there anything else that you want to say before we kind of come full circle? So we've, yeah, we've, you know, as an Indigenous person, we've been taught how to, uh, you know what, I'm actually just going to pull up, pull up something here. Great. Um, give me a second. Sorry, sure. audience, I just feel like it's really, I really want to say it. Um, There's no rush. I'll take myself off the screen so we can really focus on That gave a little update of what, what's been going on at uh, out at Naden Harbor. And I shared that post. And it, on my post that I shared, um, I wrote as a woman living in a country where they wanted to rid Indigenous lives all across the country is a life that any privileged person may not relate to on any level. We're survivors of a smallpox epidemic that was purposely introduced to wipe out our Haida people, upholding our inherent right to occupy our ancestral lands and to harvest our traditional foods is something that's been interrupted with the imposed laws to civilize us as a people. If it's thought or felt that my actions and participation to uphold our right as a Haida people is inconvenient, take a step back and read into our lives as Indigenous people and where exactly the fish and resources are being unsustainably extracted from. We're Haida people living off the land as we have since time immemorial. Our presence out there goes deeper than the pockets of corporate operations that occur on our ancestral lands. We are here. We never left. We will continue to occupy our ancestral lands and waters. And this is not mine to wear if people are offended or hurt when I speak my truth. Respect our wishes and keep Haida Gwaii closed. One visitor outside our community coming in is one too many. That's one risk too many. We're doing fine. Just respect our wishes and keep Haida Gwaii closed until we feel like it's safe to do so. We're really respectful people. We're really reasonable people. And we're really reciprocal people. When we're respected, we give respect back. All we ask is that you respect our wishes and keep Haida Gwaii closed. No exceptions. Thank you. You've got a lot of support coming in here. That's all we want. Just respect. One of the many laws that we follow. What's the word for respect, the Haida word? Dumb. How are The Mansan King. I'll see you again. 
house in Dunk Kingston. Take care. Take care. We'll be keeping keeping the conversation going. Be sure to spread the word. Uh, let people know what's going on and the gravity of the situation. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank, Thank you, Adina. We'll talk to you soon. For sure. Take care. Take care, everybody.